Steve. Hello, everyone. So my name is Wojtek, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about composing music with Closure Spec. So I hope the energy levels are going to rise. Um, this is the last talk of the day, so let's just get started. So what's on the agenda? So we're going to have some fun with Closure Spec. I hope you're ready for the second back-to-back -back spec talk. The only difference is I'm doing it the wrong way. Um, I'm going to generate some tunes. Um, and finally, I'm going to reflect on uh, generative music. All right, so what's not on the agenda? How to use Closure Spec in production? I know some of you are already doing this, even though it's alpha. Um, I'm probably not going to show you too many best practices. There's going to be code examples, but um, I think this is more of a musical talk. And there's already great resources elsewhere uh, and great talks. So who am I? This is a computer's rendition of me. Um, I think it's a pretty poor rendition, but I do like the um, chalice effect on the neck. I think, it, um, I think that's an interesting uh, little bit. So I've been composing and performing um, electronic music since about 2007 under the moniker NI. Um, I've also done some procedural 3D stuff. Uh, it used to be called the demo scene, but now not a lot of people recognize the term anymore. Um, but I also um, am a software, test, software tester by trade. So I get paid to break stuff. And one of the ways in which we break stuff is generative testing. And finding ways in which we can uh, use the software in perhaps a different way than it was originally intended, just to see where the edges are, where the boundaries are. So in general, I'm more interested in the chaos side of uh, software development. Um, and I'm also sort of on a vision quest of sorts uh, when it regards to generative art. Okay, so you might be wondering, you know, how does Closure Spec apply to generating music? So let me state a hypothesis. If the primary paradigm of computing music is that music is data, then we should be able to use whatever tools are at our disposal to describe data, generate data, and manipulate data um, to produce music. We're going to see if this actually turns out to be true. So I will be using, of course, Closure Spec. Um, I'm also going to be using Chris Ford's library Leipzig. That's going to be, I'm using the German pronunciation here. Um, you're probably going to be familiar with, with this if you've seen any of Chris Ford's talk, talks. And I know there's a lot of Chris Ford fanboys here, so I'm sure one of them. And finally, I'm going to be using Overtone for the actual um, audio and playback. Now, I did manage to only get um, Overtone to work with the Alpha 8 of Closure 190, but I think this should be quite enough to demonstrate what spec is, what's happening in spec right now. Um, so all of this should be pretty standard for Closure music, um, nothing too crazy. And as you can probably imagine, um, I did not build a universal music making machine with spec. Um, instead, of course, I want to focus on one particular kind of music or flavor of music. So I resisted the temptation to do something completely crazy um, and do something avant-garde, so, because it's not Paris, and it's definitely not 1924. Um, instead, I decided to pick a genre which I think is quite simple in the way that we can describe it, and also has a, a defined canon uh, and it's also close to my heart. So this music is jungle. So if you don't know jungle, I think a good way to explain it is that it's a flavor of drum and bass um, with a certain twist. Uh, let's give you some more context about what we're going to be creating today. So when speaking about computer music, we really speak of two kinds of data. Uh, one is the audio whether it's a WAV file or just any buffer of numbers that are ultimately converted from digital to analog and result in air vibration. Now, the other is the symbolic representation of music, whether it's sheet music, uh, MIDI files, or guitar tabs. Um, this is the data which serves as the blueprint for musical performance. 
And to an extent, we can translate between these two domains. We want to synthesize audio from uh, the symbolic representation, but he also may want to produce symbolic musical data uh, by analyzing or fingerprinting audio to go the other way around. Now, to create Jungle, we're going to rely on both kinds of data. Um, jungle is very heavily sample-based, uh, so I think it makes an interesting choice um, for composition. And to give you a bit of a background about the history and how Jungle was born, so the birth of Jungle is related very much to the appearance of these machines. Um, like drum and bass and hip hop, it's very much linked to the emergence of hardware samplers, hardware digital samplers. So their availability, um, lower cost and ease of use compared to tape manipulation, um, really meant the democratization um, of access to musical production tools. And so suddenly, uh, in the 90s or late 80s, you, you had a lot of people sampling vinyl records, anything they could really get their hands on. Um, and people who were not trained musicians started producing um, music that they liked and that people liked and wanted to dance to. Um, and if you ever wor haven't worked with a sample like this, uh, what it allows is you can pick, record musical data, um, store it in a bank somewhere, uh, and then you can manipulate it by looping, uh, slicing, doing pitch shifting, time stretching, reversing, those kinds of operations. Um, and musicians will often have uh, several of these um, when performing or working in the studio. All right, so what is the bare minimum that I think constitutes a classical jungle track? There hasn't been any audio here yet, but we're gonna get to that soon. I know you're waiting for it. So, at the very bare minimum, we're gonna have sampled drums, some bass lines, and vocal samples. And this is just some constraints that I, um, that I added for the purpose of this presentation. There's many flavors of jungle music, and you can add whatever you like in terms of the sonic landscape that you're actually plundering and, and slicing. Um, so let's start with the drums, because this is really the core of the jungle sound. So the drums are usually taken from breakbeats. So obviously there's a definition. Uh, a breakbeat is a sample of a syncopated drum beat, usually represented to form, repeated to form a rhythm, used as a basis for dance music, hip hop, etc. And the breakbeat is literally a break in the middle of a song when the pitched instruments um, stop playing and the drummer plays solo. These most often come from uh, funk, soul, or gospel records, 60s, 70s. Um, and, and syncopated really means that the accent is placed on the weak parts of the beat rather than the strong ones. All right, so I'm gonna play you the most iconic breakbeat of them all. So even if you're not into jungle, you've probably heard it a hundred times from, in everything from NWA straight out Compton to TV commercials for cars or, or the original Futurama theme song. And it's called the Almond Break and it even has its own Chardonnay now. That's how big of a deal it is. Um, notice that the pattern on the top is a transcription of this drum pattern um, separated um, uh, to the crash cymbal, the ride, um, snare, and bass drum. So let's listen to it, to it again, and maybe if you have good eyesight, you're gonna be able to follow along. So this is a solo from a track um, called The Ammon Brother from 1969 track by a band called The Winstons. And it happens to be one of the most sampled um, songs in the history of music. There's literally tens of thousands of different renditions of this 
sequence, which only lasted a couple of seconds. Um, the reason why this particular sample is used, I think, is because it's revered for its timbre and its rhythm, which are quite unique. Um, one of the um, contemporary musicians wanted to replicate this sound uh, some time ago, um, and they bought thousands of dollars worth of vintage equipment, um, recording st uh, studio equipment, they wanted to replicate the sound, you know, and, and they couldn't. There's something in the particular way in which the, um, the drum solo was recorded, in which it was um, recorded onto tape, in which the, the tape grain um, added uh, some compression to it. It's just very unique, and also the rhythm. If you listen to the sort of ride, it's very stable, and yet the rest of the rhythm um, is, is somewhat unstable, right? It's syncopated. It accentuates the weak parts of the beat. Okay, so we know that we want to use sampled breakbeats as the basis of our composition. So how do we represent them symbolically? And I think the easiest way is to um, ask the musicians themselves. And maybe it's a bit of a cheat because I consider myself part of that musical scene. Um, but I've also um, co collaborated with other musicians and found a very curious property. Now, this is somewhat localized information, but I think you're gonna find this amusing. So, if you looked at the wine bottle um, label that I showed you before, it had the uh, drum percussion instruments separated out, right? You had the, the, the kick, snare, ride, and crash on different lines. But this is not really what you're working with. This is not the material uh, how the material really looks like. Uh, because the sample is really just a single layer with all of those instruments layered out. Now, you could use digital signal processing to separate out just the kick, or just the cymbal, or just the snare, um, but conceptually, I think it's useful to look at the breakbeat as a single layer, as um, the, the, breakbeat, the breakbeat is the instrument. So I wanted to create a notation which um, felt natural for me to use. Um, and that's what notations should be, right? They should be uh, intuitive. They should allow for easy communication. So when I'm thinking about a jungle beat in my head, I'm going, doing something like something like a, you know, um, a pattern like this, where the actual sounds are very close to the actual sounds of the drums. Since my first language is Polish, um, I think it's um, fair to say that we can call the Polish jungle notation. Uh, there is no resemblance to that of Łukasiewicz, but um, you know, you get the, get the joke. So um, at the very simplest, we could think of as a set of single syllable onomatopoeic sounds which correspond to the dominant percussion sound happening at a specific time. Um, but this information isn't really enough to get us going. Um, as in most genres of electronic music, but not limited to electronic music, uh, the repetition is key. So what we really need to do is to define some rules as to you know, what, these signs, uh, what these sounds are and how we can repeat them. So here's a contrived example of um, how we can define simple rules for how many times a specific sound can be repeated in a row. Um, and we just build a collection that we can um, use out of that. Um, there's an additional sort of semantic element um, where we can name uh, the, the, the syllables, the outcomes, by the specific drum uh, elements like the kick or ride semi-snare combination. Okay, so there's an interesting property um, about breakbeats. Um, that is, they are composable. So if you take different renditions of the Armand break and other breakbeats in general, we can sort of mix and match parts of them, rearrange them, place them in, in some order, and use interchangeably um, 
to create our composition. So to do this, what we really need to do, as is the case with all sample music, is that we need to prepare. And what we need to prepare is a sample bank which has some characteristics. So these are the characteristics I picked for this particular composition. So the drum loops are equal in length, they're in the same tempo, and the volume is normalized. So if we want to just um, have some interchangeable um, elements, then it's good that they are prepared and normalized ahead of, the, ahead of time. So very simple stuff. I load them up as a bunch of audio buffers. I have a simple function which only does one thing. It uh, plays back a specific slice um, given a start time and an end time, the buffer. Um, and then I'm just going to pick some free renditions of the Amon break to begin with, that we'll start working with. And here's what they sound like. First one. So these are all variations on the original Amon break that I played you, yet they have different patterns. They didn't have the same drum pattern, and they also had um, a specific timbre to them, right? Different um, equalization, um, perhaps some filtering. And this is why uh, what gives the uh, combination of these some interesting properties. So, you know, we can play a single sound from one of the breaks. It's just gonna sound like this. Um, what we really need to define is some mappings from the, um, from the sort of Polish jungle notation sounds to um, specific parts of, the, um, of, uh, of our breakbeats. And so what I'm using here is really somewhat of a familiar notation um, that it, from Western music, which is to use rational numbers just to slice things up. And this is exactly what we're doing. All of those breakbeats can be divided into eight parts of equal length. Um, and since these are actually played by good drummers, um, the tempo is going to match up quite well. All right, so now we can generate a sequence from um, the spec we saw earlier. Uh, we just flattened the rep repetitions that were created, pick four bars of eight sounds, and Rhythmize just takes a collection of uh, Ammon sounds uh, or breakbeat sounds which have relative duration and arranges them in time using absolute values. Okay, so finally ready to hear something composed here. Um, I'm repeating the entire sequence two times here and I'm gonna playing it at a brisk tempo of 172 beats per minute. So that's kind of musical, and when I got to this point, I was kind of happy. Um, I knew that, you know, if you take this and compare it to like a very early 90s jungle track, it's actually pretty similar um, to an extent. So now I'm, you know, uh, I already got to some point in musical history, and you have to remember that you know, when speaking about the early 90s and jungle musicians and sample music, um, you have to understand that the, the, the way they used samplers were very simple. And all of those very elaborate techniques for slicing, uh, manipulating breakbeats, those evolve over the course of the 90s, um, somewhat accumulating in uh, late 90s, early 2000s with um, uh, IDM. Uh, artists like uh, Venetian Snares or Square Pusher or Affix Twin, who really took the manipulation of breakbeats and specifically the arm and break to a new level um, in co running, playing at very high speeds um, to the point where the, um, the original sound is almost uh, unintelligible. Some of that information is, is lost. Uh, one of those techniques which are very interesting is that if you take especially the snare drum, um, 
you can, uh, musicians have been treating it as a pitched instrument. So playing it as if it were a pitched instrument and you could um, manipulate it on the scale and, uh, and change things. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, we can mix and match different breakbeat sounds. Um, in this case, I'm doing this at runtime. So, um, you know, when you're speaking about some chance techniques in music, this is, this is chance techniques 101, right? We have um, a, a collection of equivalent um, techniques, in this case, sounds that we want to play, uh, and we just pick one at random and see what happens. Are you guys hearing this right? Or maybe we can put the volume up a bit. All right, so the next section is effects. And this is something that I haven't really implemented yet, but I do have a good idea of how this model could look like. So if you ever saw a musical software uh, called Trackers. So a tracker is a classical piece of computer, um, computer software where we have um, a sequence of, um, of events in time where we can have something happen. And this can be playback of a sample um, or triggering of a specific instrument. Um, and for each of those notes, we can define a bank of effects that can happen at this time. So we can say that at time zero, we have just regular playback, but the next time we, hit, we add some effects, you know, whether it's pitch shifting, you know, to play the snare as a pitched instrument. It's adding, um, adding uh, filters or reverb or other effects, um, or maybe reversing the audio. And with that, we can expand it with even wilder variations. Um, there's really a lot of variations we can do to replicate the kind of edits that humans, human musicians were doing in the studio. Okay, so I've set up the scene for slicing breakbeats. Um, let me just briefly talk about the bass pattern. And it's pretty simple. Um, I mean, I didn't want to complicate the bass too much. Um, so um, the sequences are rather rudimentary. Um, the bass in Jungle plays a rather simple role. Simple in the sense of um, the, uh, the melody it plays but very important because of the sound it has. And uh, in most, uh, especially in the early jungle, um, this is just a simple sine oscillator that generates a um, thumping bass sound, something like this. So you get the idea, right? Um, it doesn't sound like much just by itself, but when you uh, overlay the breakbeat over it, it starts to add up. Now, uh, bass is obviously a pitched instrument, um, meaning that the height of the sound varies to create a melody. Um, and spe when speaking about melodies in the West, we think of them as sequences of notes, where a note is so a single tone of definite pitch made by a musical instrument or the human voice. Now, we could just you know, represent pitch in the usual fashion, um, in computer music, we, use, we tend to use MIDI, which is, just uses integers um, in a certain range. Here we're operating on two octaves, um, and the duration is represented again by the familiar uh, rational numbers, no, the rational numbers used in sheet music. Uh, playing pitch as random integers is sort of like having, having a monkey sit at a piano. They may get it right eventually, but we might actually get annoyed with our primate companions first. So instead, um, we can compose Leipzig's scale functions to transform our random integers into random integers, which happen to fit on a scale of our choosing. Um, so let's listen to, to, to just such an example. So I don't know how well you could hear that. Uh, it wasn't great, but at least I didn't hate it, so we can move on. 
All right, so let's add the final spice to our mix, um, the vocal samples. And, and specifically in jungle music, um, we're going to be using raga samples. And this is not raga, the, um, the South Indian classical music uh, technique, but this is um, a style of dance music originating from Jamaica and derived from reggae, uh, in which the DJ improvises over a sampled or electronic backing track. So we can listen to, to an example of what this uh, sounds like. Redeem of Redeem culture, y'all. So I'm not an expert in uh, Jamaican English, but I think it, the gentleman said, rhythm is full of culture. Um, and I don't know why specifically um, these raga, be, raga samples were picked as the sort of canonical base that um, jungle musicians picked from. It might just be that they were of Jamaican ethnicity and they were really into the Jamaican scene. Um, but re really, what we're working for here is not, not anything fancy at all. Uh, so again, just loading up a set of these samples, um, specifying some timing between them. All right, so let's hear these um, all three together. So, so this particular combination would probably be described as raga jungle, right? Makes sense. Um, all right, so we know how to build a short sequence that is somewhat satisfactory. So what is stopping us from building up an entire song from this? So um, let's just specify some sort of arrangement that we're going to follow. Um, using the rather familiar, at least in, in drum and bass, um, pattern of intro, verse, breakdown, um, reprise, and outro. Um, and this can broadly really mean two things. Um, either there's a verse, meaning that we play all of our instruments, and this is a real um, interesting bit, um, or there's some sort of place where the beat maybe doesn't play, and that's the intro, breakdown, and outro. Uh, and you know, we specify the keys that should be present in the, the particular um, part of the song. And we can really even you know, generate some funny artist names, um, or song titles, and album names. Really, if, if you think, start thinking about it, um, why stop at generating single songs if we can generate whole discographies. Um, just to show you the sort of telescoping nature of musical composition coming from single notes, and if you think about granular synthesis, which, which would slice up a sample into thousands of elements, even uh, below that, all the way through to entire collections of artists, um, you know, there's sort of uh, an interesting uh, zooming effects that, that you get. Um, and this is very useful, because if I'm a performing musician and I want to perform a two, three, maybe even four hour long set, um, I now have a compositional tool um, to which I can delegate some of the work. Um, and maybe because of that, I can focus on other things, right? Some other aspects of performance. Um, because I've delegated some of the stuff to um, a program. All right, so, you know, we can create whole albums, you know, give them names, call discographies, you know, we can differentiate between different kinds of releases, right? We can say, okay, this is a dub plate, so most likely it's uh, uh, a representation of a, a vinyl record which uh, has two sides, right, an A and B side. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of going um, further and further. You know? I feel like I could, you know, take over the world. You know, you kind of see where this is going in a nefarious way. 
So is there any practical reason why do you want to do this? Who would even want to listen to all of that generated music? Is there enough airtime in the world to listen to all of that stuff? Um, and the examples you've heard today are, you know, okay at best. This is not really virtuoso playing. Um, I think it's a start. So there's some interesting properties um, that I found when we use specs that play to our advantage. And one of them is that we can share specs between the generating backend and perhaps some sort of front-end application. Um, so, you know, who's going to listen to all those songs? Well, the users are going to listen to these songs, tell us which are good. We're going to take these songs. We know where they were generated from. We can improve on that. Um, maybe even we can steal um, uh, an idea from uh, Karen Meyer's uh, arsenal and have genetic algorithms uh, and have specs fighting each other to see which one produces the best tunes. Um, and humans could provide feedback to the generating process. You know, what's stopping us? We can do this. We can generate some documentation with live example data, um, have people edit the specs uh, in line and just see what they sound like. We can do this. We have the technology. Um, yeah, we can just, you know, Right, and uh, because specs are data, we can, we can treat them as data and just take things out of them and create representations. Sure, we can do that. All right, so um, I'd like to talk now about what I think worked in this little thought experiment of mine. Well, maybe it's not even a thought experiment since we have something tangible, the music. Um, I think the end result is, Kind of decent, I mean, in a 1993 kind of way. Um, and I'm happy. I'm happy because I now have a jam buddy. I can have a program that's going to create um, a lazy sequence of uh, almond breaks and play it for me. And I can just jam to it, you know? It's, um, I don't need musical friends now. I can just jam with myself. It's very scalable um, and convenient. Um, I also have a um, sort of single data specification that I can share between um, a backend and frontend for the purpose of any um, applications that I might want to um, build on top of it. I think the biggest gain is because I'm a musical perfectionist, which is, um, I think, just shorthand for someone who is very bad at finishing stuff, um, you know, I can produce a lot of stuff and maybe I'm going to take 1% of those generated beats and, and, and play them on the live sets. I'm going to throw everything else away and move on with my life. What didn't work? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but so the closure spec generators are sort of unaware of context, meaning that all of those elements that we've stitched together that were generated independently of each other. So the, the generation had no awareness that, you know, a common pattern is puchita, right? But it just maybe randomly found this particular, this particular uh, element. Um, and there's really little we can do to build sane generators that are also context aware of what came before in the sequence. Um, in addition to that, I try to um, create generate parameters for overtone synths just to see, you know, where we could be go going with this. But I'm not going to play any of those examples because, one, we might pop the speakers, um, and two, we probably wouldn't like it. Yeah, I didn't like it. And, and I think the, the reason for it is that, again, um, the generations are independent um, in the sense that if we adjust the resonance of a filter, which has consequences for the overall volume, but also we uh, gener generate some sort of volume level, you know, if those twos come up as very high, then this is going to be something that we're going to need to normalize. And we didn't really, really go on to go into that too much. So I'm not going to show you any of it. 
All right, so remember this slide? Um, and I'm going to start a rant now, so beware. So I don't think this is right. Um, I don't think that we can think of computer music as just data. Um, and there's a very specific reason. Um, and that's because this ignores a very important element that is human cognition. Uh, there is a lot of things which get lost if we just look at the data and try to combine them together. Um, I mean, there's a reason why I decided not to generate rap music, because if I offend someone, am I liable? You know? um, and in this sense, there's a whole area of human perception, acoustics, mood, context, of which most of generative, generative music is not aware. And from now, I'd like to move to this sort of interesting model for thinking about relationships between uh, humans and technology. And, and that is that there is a certain tension between the design, what was intended, and what was the appropriation, or how the people actually used it, right? Um, spec may not have been thought of as a platform for generative music, um, but I used it that way, right? Um, luckily, there was nothing preventing me from doing that, uh, which perhaps means that it was a good design. But, you know, as William Gibson wrote, the street finds its own use for things. So even if you um, take a piece of software that was intended for creating, uh, you know, improving the quality of your software, um, I can just come at it from a musical or artistical perspective and say, I'm just going to use it to create something totally different. And this is fine, right? And when, when I talk to people about generative music, I often find sort of two, two different reactions. One is that, oh, it's all generated. Um, there is no human aspect to it. It's all very dry. It's inhumane. Um, and on the other hand, it, you have people who say, OK, this is not autonomous at all. Uh, it's a contrived example. It's pretty much all human uh, creation. And I don't think either of these um, are necessarily true. Rather, this, the agency is, is, is hybridized between um, the human, the musician, and the various pieces of technology. And what I mean by that is that if we look at live performance, and I'm talking about something specific called laptop music. Um, in this example, it's two artists. One is generating music. Uh, the other one is generating visuals. And I don't know if you can read that, but there's sort of four categories of interaction here. Uh, so human to human, human perception, human machine, and machine to machine. Um, and what this really shows is that there's a lot of layers in this performance. It's hard to tell where's the agent, right? So there's a musician, there's a DJ playing, and you know, they, there's another artist who's producing visuals. And maybe they've talked together. Uh, maybe they said, oh, when I play track A, you know, play that cool video of the beach. Um, but maybe they haven't. Maybe it's all um, OK. I'm the, uh, as a visual artist, I'm listening to the music, thinking what it evokes. Uh, and then I'm asking my computer to do something, right? Um, and it, it, the computer is often seen as a black box. And a lot of technologies are sort of black box. Well, the black box, as in you cannot see what's inside until it breaks. Um, and there's a lot of levels um, that are hidden or black box in, in technical systems. Um, you know, we have to go through some sort of graphical user interface or, you know, the REPL. Uh, there's some software that maybe we wrote, maybe someone else wrote, maybe it's, you know, Unix code from the 70s. There's OS drivers. There's all these layers you go through. And, you know, you may be thinking that, oh, I clicked this, but there is some agency of countless thousands of people who have worked on the software, on the hardware that you're using, that you're not immediately aware of. And maybe you don't need to, because that is a huge uh, sort of cognitive, um, cognitive load to go through. 
Um, and when it breaks, obviously, you know, you get hit with a stack trace in the face, and you're thinking, okay, now I know that this box has opened, and I can sort of peer into it, and maybe I don't understand it. And I think it's important to see ways in which art can sort of open up these black boxes um, and question some of the presumptions we may have about um, technological systems. And one of my favorite examples um, is a project called Coal Fired Computers, 300 um, million black, sorry, 300 million computers, 318,000 black lungs. And it's an art installation um, created by Harwood, Yokokoji, and Denmark, where you have, um, so on the right hand side, uh, a computer which is powered by a um, coal powered boiler, which pumps all the exhaust gases into this sort of artificial lung that. Um, with the, with the coal sort of accreting inside of it. And, and what is demonstrated is that although we may have the perception that, you know, the technological goods we have, the laptops, smartphones, they seem to be clean, but we forget that um, the energy which was used to produce them, to manufacture them, and often the, what, what we power them with, perhaps, you know, came from burning coal. And there's some coal miners in China who, um, who died prematurely because, you know, the coal dust got into their lungs. So I think the role of the artist here is in sort of deconstructing various black boxes um, that are not obvious on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we can do with this next, right? I mean, we have this sort of generative system. We have some ideas about um, what can go, uh, what can come next. And I think one interesting aspect I think is what I would call self-healing um, live performances. And just to give you an example, let's say that you want to play in C major, um, and then you have a spec that, you know, this specifies the valid values, but, you know, your finger slips and you're about to play a discordant two tone. Well, we can see that, you know, oh, you're about to uh, do something invalid. I'm just gonna replace the sound with some valid, valid note that you've defined just so you don't have to worry about it, right? Um, I like that um, uh, Stuart Holloway said yesterday that spec is preventing him from doing stupid things. Uh, why not apply that to musical performance? Um, there's a quote attributed to Sid Barrett, the uh, late frontman of Pink Floyd, who said that it's not important to know which notes to play, it's just important to know which not to play. All right, so where we can go, where else we can go? So the second thing I wanted to explore is sort of expose a live stream of generated music uh, where people can listen to it, maybe listen to different flavors of it. Um, a big fan of this radio station called um, Jungle Train. It's a human-run radio station, for I can tell, unless they're really, um, really hiding everything. Um, you, should, you should give it a listen. Um, most of the time, it sounds much better than what I played. Sometimes, I think my stuff is actually better. Um, but that's just because there's tens of thousands of jungle songs and, you know, it's just fatigue. All right, and the final thing I want to explore is the cognitive aspect. Um, I'm going to be wrapping up here, but I'm just going to mention what I mean by this. So trying to think about how, um, as software developers and musicians, we can um, incorporate more knowledge of human cognition and, and how hearing works and our um, perception of music um, into our daily practices. Um, some couple of resources that I think are really good if you want to get into this, this topic. Um, there was supposed to be a GitHub link here, but uh, I've been gradually just messing this code up more and more before the presentation, so um, I guess you can just follow me on Twitter and uh, I should have this code up running uh, in case you want to play with it. And I would invite you to, um, to maybe take your favorite kind of music and try to make a model. Maybe you can generate something interesting. Um, that's it. All right. So um, there's one final thing. Uh, I just wanted to play you out with a little tune. Uh, one second. I know this is showing right.
Tum, ta -dum, tum, tum. Okay, here we are. Let's play some tunes. This is pretty verbose, but that's just so you can uh, tell what's going on sequentially. That's all I got, thank you. <laughs>